share my screen. We're going to wait about one minute and then we're going to get started today to talk about estables. Just a few more seconds and we'll get started so more people can join. Well, thank you all for joining this Facebook Live event. My name is Jerry Frank and I'm the co-founder and <coughs> CEO of Stratifolio. So we're a web-based software solution designed to help commercial real estate companies and we help in four specific area, areas. We help with financial management, asset management, operations management, and investor management. And with me today is Larry Silvestri of Silvestri Law. Larry's an attorney out of beautiful St. Petersburg, Florida, and he focuses on commercial real estate, real estate transaction. He works with both landlords and tenants, both small and large, buyers and sellers, of commercial real estate for vacant land development, and he helps to cost effectively negotiate and document and close those deals. So thank you so much, Larry, for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, Jerry. I am excited to do this. Yeah, so our, our format for today is going to be about 20 minutes or so of Q&A. Um, you and I will go through some stuff and then we will wait to see what kind of questions we get from the audience and we'll go through those as well. So I always like to begin with really basic stuff. Let's lay out what is an estoppel. Okay. Uh, an estoppel is basically a snapshot of the status of a lease transaction. Uh, it can be other than leases, but we're talking about leases today primarily. Uh, the other things it can be used for is reciprocal easement agreements where there are obligations, but it's to have one party, mm -hmm. typically the tenant, certify for the benefit of third parties the status of the lease, the fact that it's in full force and effect, whether it's been amended, um, that the tenant isn't in default. Mm -hmm. and that there are no things that are lurking in the background that with the passage of time or whatever uh, will become a default mm -hmm. uh, and that the landlord has delivered possession and any improvements that were supposed to be accomplished are done a tenant improvement allowance that was owed was paid that uh, how much the rent currently is because a lot mm -hmm. of times these estoppels are presented uh, in the middle of a term. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that everybody's got their books right about what the increases are and what the CAM is. And there's that there's uh, uh, basically concurrence between what the landlord shows on the rent roll mm -hmm. and what the tenant believes is their obligation. Mm -hmm. And you can ask for a lot of other things to be certified in there. Um, you would always want to know whether or not there are options to extend or mm -hmm option to purchase mm -hmm. or right of first refusal or things of that nature. Um, so the, the, the tenant is the tenant, you know, that hasn't been assigned or sublet. Mm -hmm. All those things are, are very important for the third party, which is typically either a potential purchaser or a lender. And um, depending on how the requirement is negotiated in the lease, and we can talk about that a little bit later, Mm -hmm. um, 
the landlord may also be able to rely on it, or it may just be for benefit of that third party. So estoppels are most frequently used, I think what you said is when a property is being purchased or when a property is being refinanced by the current owner. Is that, those are yes. the two primary reasons? Yes, um, that is, and there could be other reasons. In fact, a, a, as a landlord, if there's some question mm -hmm. that you're not in accordance with the tenant's understanding, or even um, a lot of clients do this, if it's a new construction, after you deliver and they open, you may want to get an estoppel mm -hmm. right then so that you don't have later a, a misunderstandings as to what you're supposed to deliver. So the tenant says to the landlord, certifies the landlord, yes, you've done what you're supposed to do. I've accepted the space and you put a box around that. Mm -hmm. But okay. most often, and the most brain damage comes when you're doing a sale mm -hmm. or financing. And the terms that are most frequently that you're going to encounter or as the owner or as the lender that you're, I'm sorry, as the buyer or as the lender that you may request a, an estoppel for, what, term, what terms are the most frequently covered? Um, you mean the terms from the lease? Yes. Those, those items that, that, I mean, it's really the essence of the deal. Mm -hmm. So whatever there is of the essence of the deal, you want confirmation on that. The rent, future rent bumps, you may want. Mm -hmm. um, but if the tenant confirms that the lease that you're looking at is the lease and it has the rent bumps in it, and you can determine that, then that's good. Mm -hmm. But if there's a calculation to be made, or if there's a fair market adjustment, then you can get those things confirmed. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest things is to Get the tenant to say there are no other understandings or agreements. And I, through my career, I've had examples where, where shopping centers have been purchased, where after the purchase, the tenants claim, well, I had a side agreement with the landlord and the landlord said that I didn't have to do this or um, that uh, something was waived, um, but the buyer didn't know that. And as long as the buyer has the estoppel certificate, Mm -hmm. And this is where the estoppel comes in. The tenant is barred or stopped or estopped from contradicting what they've said in the estoppel certificate, estoppel letter, um, lease confirmation, you know, can be, have different titles. Right. But so those terms, which are essential to the deal, are the most important ones. So if I'm a buyer and I'm very concerned about if tenants have any termination rights, mm -hmm. I'd better ask. Mm -hmm. I can't just leave it to what's in the lease, even though I have the lease, you still want to ask them to confirm for your benefit as the third party that's gonna step into the shoes of the landlord. Mm -hmm. um, and lenders, uh, frankly, are notorious for requiring very long estoppel certificates. Mm -hmm. And I've been in the circumstance with lenders where there are leases which say the tenant's obligated to give an estoppel certificate confirming the following five main things and whatever else is reasonably requested. Right. Or with the, with the major in the shopping center industry, the retail industry, uh, a lot of the, the chain store tenants actually have the form of estoppel they're willing to give as part of the lease deal. Uh. So, because they know it's a pain in the butt to review all of everything else. But the lender has often said, look, we know that you have to ask for our form. If they don't give you back our form and they give us what they're obligated to under the lease, okay, we'll give you a pass. But you have to go through the exercise of asking first. <laughs> so <laughs> lenders hold the card. So we say, yes, we'll do that. Um, but then in the cover letter, I'll say to the tenant, Here's what we're asking you for, but we understand if you mm -hmm. comply with the lease, you're good. <laughs> so, so in some ways, if you're buying as an owner, you're buying a building, you've seen what the, the lease is, maybe even the amendments, but in the end, 
It is the estoppel that overrides the lease? As between that third party, yes. Now that's, that's a question that's often asked. The, the, the estoppel certificate is not intended to be an amendment to the lease. Right. Which is the sophisticated tenants in their leases say, when we give you an estoppel, it's not for you landlord to rely on. It's for the third party. So you landlord can't hide behind a mistake that we make in this estoppel by certifying something that was wrong. But if the third party relies on it, we have to live with it. Hmm. So there's, you know, most estoppel certificate, certificate requests that go out, requests that the land, that everybody can rely on it. <laughs> right. But that's a, a, a legal distinction that savvy tenants understand. So is there ever a situation where the current owner getting ready to sell the property um, reaches out to their current tenants, gets an estoppel, and they disagree with what the tenant, tenant has said in the estoppel? Yes. Yes. What, what so, happens so there? I, if I can take a little point of departure here to go through the, the process that yeah. I've been involved with to get the estoppels. You start with um, an analysis of the lease mm -hmm. and analysis of the situation. The purchase and sale agreement may have a type or a, a um, form of estoppel that they want. As I said, lenders are more likely to do that. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to kind of uh, review the form, complete the form. You, you don't just send it to the tenant, have the tenant fill in the expiration date and the options and everything else. So, so it's a process. Mm -hmm. And I've done it for regional malls. We've got over hundred tenants that you've got to do it for. So either internally or you can outsource that. Mm -hmm. um, someone has to prepare those requests. Mm -hmm. There's usually a cover letter and then the actual estoppel certificate that you want them to sign and send mm -hmm. back to you within 10 days or five days or you know, whatever, because it's very important for the process. Mm -hmm. Then you wait for a little bit and then you follow <laughs> up. And um, depending on the nature of the, of the occupancy, you know, th this is the same thing for office buildings. You'll have tenants that just ignore it. Right. And you can say in the lease, but if they don't send you the estoppel, it's their acquiescence or confirmation that everything you've put in the, the estoppel can be relied on. Mm -hmm. but no one wants to rely on that that's a second level thing that's that's a like a backstop so you try to collect as many as you can and if the tenant sends you one that has uh something that disagrees with with your books and records or your interpretation of the lease then you have to follow up on that and and kind of run it to ground right. to either concede that the tenant is right or to pursue the tenant and get them to agree that they're wrong, somehow reconcile. Right. You can't leave it out there. And uh, as part of this whole process, when you're selling a large asset with a lot of tenants, you, you try to negotiate, whether it's with a lender or a buyer, that you don't have to deliver 100% of the estoppels because it becomes very hard. Mm -hmm. Even though they're obligated to do so, even though you can put them in default. <laughs> And then what are you going to do, a victim? No. Yeah. So um, in a shopping center, typically you'll have to deliver estoppels from the major tenants. And that's usually not so hard because they're sophisticated. They know the process. A lot of them have a person or a department, mm -hmm. but that's what they do. Uh, but the smaller tenants, the you know office or mom and pop that don't really understand it, that you just may never be able to shake it out of them. So one of the things that you provide for is a percentage of the non-anchor or the percentage of the, the uh, non-credit office tenants mm -hmm. that you're not relying on for the, for the loan or for the sale um, don't have to be delivered. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's, it's two categories. With the shopping center, it might be these anchor tenants plus a certain number of these junior anchors plus a percentage of, of everybody else. Um, 
And then with respect to the tenants uh, where you don't get an estoppel, you get the landlord estoppel. So okay. separate from the reps and warranties and conditions of the loan or the personal sale agreement, mm -hmm. the landlord says, I certify that what I put in this uh, request that the tenant didn't respond to is accurate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, as the buyer, I have a standalone representation right. that I can pursue if it turns out that's not right, mm -hmm. uh, rather than just the general reps and warranties that, that this is the lease. Right. So that's kind of how you close the gap as best you can right. uh, to get the deal closed. Yeah, and I'm, I'm guessing at that moment where you're trying to close a deal, whether it's for a loan or for a property you're purchasing, at that point, you're just trying to get it done. Yes, um, everybody's fairly pregnant and um, you don't want to walk away from it because some few tenants just can't get their attention. Right. And, um, you know, if, it's a, if, if you're local and it's a local deal, you're knocking on doors. Right. <laughs> um, I've, you know, we've had local when we have properties that aren't local, we've had local agents mm -hmm. do that because it's it's a significant issue right. with a third party. Um, is that it is not getting the estoppels the most significant problem you encounter, or is it something else? Uh, it, it's it's one of them. Okay. What else? What else is a significant issue around the estoppel process? Um, well, you mentioned one, which is if the if the facts don't agree. Yep. And you know that that that's a difficult one. Um, if by chance the lease was signed without language requiring an estoppel, mm. uh, you can have a big headache. Mm. Uh, and that happens. Um, you know, smaller properties or or, or you know, like locally managed stuff. Um, most lease forms have something in there about an estoppel or a certification, but not all of them do. Um, in that situation where it doesn't require it, then it really is up to the tenant to provide that or not. Right. You still request it and, and you'd still use your relationship mm -hmm. um, to explain to the tenant, you know, what, why it actually it's mutually beneficial. Right. It's done properly. It's not intended, it's really not intended to catch the tenant right. and have them confirm something that's wrong. Right. It's intended to, to position them with the new landlord, not so much the lender, but with the new landlord so that they're on the same page. Right. So as an owner, the, I actually got this question earlier, as an owner, as a, as a newly purchasing owner of a property, should you require that you get a stopples? Yes. And on all sizes, on all types of assets? Um, yes. Okay. Single tenant net leased property, very important because okay. all your underwriting is, is what that deal is. Mm -hmm. Multi-tenant property, you know, while you may not need estoppels from all of them, um, it, it's not just the circumstance where a seller or a borrower is trying to defraud Mm -hmm. the buyer or the lender, there are legitimate disagreements as to how things add up. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see circumstances where the landlord um, hasn't increased the pass-throughs regularly, but is entitled to. Right. And so then that comes up and, and you know, you have to be reasonable. And, and if you want to catch up, Mm -hmm. And you really have to reach out to that tenant and explain the circumstances and, and get them to agree or cut a, a new deal so that the next party, the, bu the buyer, mm -hmm. isn't burdened by your inattentiveness or failure. And that happens more often you know, than, than we want to believe. Um, right. It's helpful if you have sophisticated software Right. Where you put in the information and it reminds you. But, yeah, um, really good software for that. Yeah, that might make a difference. 
Yeah, you know, so just to put a little more clarity around that, you're really talking about a situation where a current tenant is has been paying the same CAM operating um, or taxes and insurance payment. They've been doing that same level for a, a long period of time. And the, and the owner, the current owner has never increased that. Yes. That's, that's really what you're talking about. And so then everything kind of comes home to roost when that purchase or that sale is happening. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate for that owner because they have now really undervalued their property to some extent as well. Um, but it is, it does show up there is what you're saying. Well, yes, the, the owner's rent roll might match what they're receiving because they didn't ever right. change the rent roll because they didn't really, um, fully understand what the lease entitled them to. This, this happens sometimes when people acquire property that mm -hmm. is developed and leased by somebody else. Right. And the rent maybe ratchets up each year, but mm -hmm. they don't realize that it's a modified gross lease where it starts out as a gross number, but then you have the ability to pass through the increases in your taxes and CAM. Mm -hmm. And that one I've seen like several times right. pops up some point where the landlord either either someone um abstracting or, or analyzing the lease says well why doesn't why didn't you, why does this match right. why has it been flat or mm -hmm. yeah i i'm guessing the other thing that you probably encounter as well are um commencement dates are a little messy yes I mean, I, I typically re recommend when, when the commencement date isn't a date that's stated in the lease that you do a, a commencement and expiration date uh, uh, addendum or right. letter to confirm those things, but that's not always done too. And, and the estoppel is a good place for that, which is why some landlords, some developers have the practice of asking for an estoppel once that's been determined and and to confirm that there's no other expectations about right. improvements yeah so that, it's a tool you know that you can use for that and and which is why landlords want the language in the lease to say that at any time mm -hmm. upon request reasonable request you'll certify these things right to us and to third parties uh, that makes a lot of sense from a developer standpoint. It just makes it clean from the get go on when something was taken, taken possession, what improvements were made. If there are any outstanding issues, it's, it's clean from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you are, um, as the purchasing owner, um, do you, you do have say into what goes out in that, in that estoppel questionnaire, correct? Yes, it's a negotiated point mm -hmm. with the purchase and sale agreement. Okay. Um, but you you have to be reasonable and not ask the seller to get things that they can't get. Right. But yes. So and, and, and it could be like I said with the lender, where, where it, you're buying it and you say, this is the estoppel form we want, mm -hmm. request it, and then we'll pass judgment on whether or not what we receive back is good enough. Right, right. Uh, as a new owner, so so let's just say this is a fresh building, fresh leases. Are there what terms would you make sure to include in that lease around estoppels? Assuming that no big box store has a, you know is going to negotiate something else out, but well, I, I actually have a list because I oh, can't yeah. use my memory. Uh, the accuracy of the documents that represent the lease. Okay. Is there a guarantee? Mm -hmm. uh, is there, are, are there amendments? Are there letters that are actually supplemental or, or amendatory to the lease? Because that then all becomes the lease. So that's like the starting place. Uh, confirmation of the commencement and expiration dates. Mm -hmm. Confirmation of the current rent, including base rent and additional rent. The amount of any security deposit being held. Mm -hmm. Confirmation that any tenant improvements required have been constructed okay and if there's any money that's supposed to change hands like if the tenant did the improvement and they're supposed to get cash or free rent period what that is mm -hmm. uh confirmation lease hasn't been assigned or sublet mm. 
Okay. Uh, early on, that's probably not likely, but you still, that's one of those things. Uh, and again, early on, th there's no default, uh, but you still ask the question, especially okay. asking that the tenant doesn't know of anything that would rise to a, a landlord default. Right, right. Um, and that's generally like to their knowledge, but it's helpful but to flesh that out as well. Uh, confirmation that there's no purchase options, options to expand, options to terminate, okay. right of first refusal, right of first offer, all those things that like get, get to the heart of uh, um, what the relationship can become. Mm -hmm. Right. Or tenant. Um, and that's, you know, those are the biggies. Okay. All right. So I, I am sure you've encountered a lot of really interesting things in your years of, of doing law and estoppels, but maybe you can share one of your most interesting stories briefly. Well, let's see if I can come up with a, my most interesting one. But let, let me say for the audience that um, I'm in private practice now, but for 25 years, I was in-house counsel, general counsel for development companies developing shopping centers, primarily retail properties, but also offices and industrial mm -hmm. at, uh, from single tenant net leased to regional malls. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one, of the, one of the more difficult ones was a uh, off-price retailer, very well-known off-price retailer that's known uh, for having a very difficult lease. Mm -hmm. And uh, we delivered possession and we were late. And we knew we were late, uh, uh, but the shopping center was being done in phases. Mm -hmm. And we delivered it late and, and we were trying to get them to confirm that they'd accepted mm -hmm. and that we delivered and that when the rent was gonna start, which, which was frankly after um, several months of free rent like eight months. Oh, nice. <laughs> because of what we missed. Right. Um, well, they didn't agree. They thought that the, cl the clock on completion kept ticking until we completed the second phase. Oh. That was how they interpreted their lease. And I talked to someone in internal who I'd met through ICSC Mm -hmm. uh, who I'd known for a number of years, who had been with a, another retailer, and, but now was the vice president there. And I said, surely you can't expect in a phased construction for that to be what the landlords agreed to. And he said, well, that's exactly what our language means. And I said, well, look at it again, because I edited that language. I had negotiated out the ambiguity that they were relying on uh -huh. that they could do it. So it's really not an estoppel, really, but that did, you know, flush out the disagreement. Right. Well, I'm sure they were very disappointed to know that they were going to have to pay rent. <laughs> yes, they would have preferred not to. But uh, <laughs> uh, the, a, a lot of the, the experience that I have are, aren't like memorable things. Right. Uh, individually, it's just the brain damage of trying to get all of them in yep. and to deal with, with the tenants who are reluctant, who don't understand why they have to do this. Right. Um, and, and frankly, part of the process is the, the tenants that, that have in-house representation or whatever, they do a good job of marking up what we request. Right. So, so it's limited. And um, you have to decide whether or not really the as the test is the lender or the buyer, right. um, whether that's sufficient to rely on. And they and one of the things that they often do is they say this can only be relied on by the you know the person you've identified, not the next buyer, right, or, or next lender, just to limit that so they get another bite at the apple. Well, we're kind of getting close to the end of our our time. Is there anything else that we didn't cover that you think? someone should know about an estoppel? Um, we talked about the fact that, that they're not intended to override mm -hmm. the terms of the lease. And, and, and this is really like a legal area that is, is gray. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, because the estoppel principle says, I'm the tenant, I told you that, you, you can rely on it. Right. But there's other principles like mutual mistake, where yet the landlord put something in that was wrong, the mm -hmm. tenant didn't catch that it was wrong, so should the tenant be bound by that? So it gets a little... Uh, I, I am sure it does get a little... And I suppose that becomes part of that reconciliation process at the end. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Larry, for, for sharing your, your expertise. I'm going to put up our, our contact information. So um, if anybody wants to contact you, uh, your contact information is on the screen. So is Stratifolios as well. Um, and Larry is a, sounds like he's a great, you're a great resource for all things that happen to, to do with commercial leasing. Um, so please feel free to reach out to Larry if you're interested in how Stratifolio can help you manage your CAM and prevent some of the things that Larry was talking about from happening. We are a great source for, for helping automate and prevent errors like that. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day.